Mr. President, you have done tremendous work in Haiti. And this question is from one of our online students. He is his second year, Wilson Lewis, who's joining us online. And he wanted to ask you, as an experienced public servant who works with Haiti, what would you suggest for Haiti's development as one of the poorest countries and countries ravaged by, by violence throughout, especially in the last 18 months, what would indicate better diplomatic relations and a better tomorrow for Haiti? Well, first of all, I've, I've, I've had three great encounters with Haiti in my life. Hillary and I went with a friend of ours who worked for Citibank on a belated honeymoon trip to Haiti in 1975. And that's back when you got all these frequent flower miles and he just, he said, I'm giving you a wedding present. I'm taking you in December to Haiti. We opened a branch of Citibank down there. We've got a Haitian manager, he's a nice man. And we'll go to Port-au-Prince and pretend we're Graham Greene. And uh, they wrote a book about it. But anyway, uh, and there was, uh, so we went and it was stunning but you could tell how badly the country had been hurt by uh, neglect. And it was a place where the oligarchs, economic oligarchs who control the country, there were about six families that had a huge percent of the GDP. They would rather have 100% of a small pie than 10% of a pie that was 100 times bigger. So that's a big problem. And, but it's a fascinating culture. It was my first exposure to voodoo. And Hillary and I spent a day with a man named Max Beauvoir, who was a Haitian who was educated at NYU and the Sorbonne and made millions in uh, a drug business in Paris. And his grandfather was the head voodoo priest and he said, Max, I'm dying. You have to come home. And I mean, without thinking, he took his tall, blonde-haired wife from, who was French and their two beautiful coffee-colored daughters, and he came home and spent the rest of his life. Because in, 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 at the time, the voodoo priests were basically all the government that existed outside of the cities. So he explained all this to us, and we saw unbelievable things. When I became president, I restored Aristide to uh, a military, over a military dictator who was practicing what was affectionately known as necklacing. He was putting tires around people's necks and setting them afire. And they were all scared of Aristide because he was so left-wing. He was a priest to the poor. Jesse Helms hated him. And they, and nobody wanted me to do it among the so-called the mavens, you know, they, the people. Uh, so I got three people who disagreed with me to go to Haiti and tell them that I had let General Cedrus go 10 months past the deadline of the UN and he was going. And it was Colin Powell who thought Haiti could never be a functioning democracy. Uh, it was too chaotic and violent and only the military could control it. Sam Nunn, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, who thought they could never succeed without a middle class and the middle class was too small. And he said, you can't have a functioning democracy. And unbelievably, Jimmy Carter, who somehow got to know Cedros when he was studying at Fort Benning and never thought he was always against any kind of violence, no matter what. And I said, well, but <laughs> it's going to take a lot less violence to get rid of that guy than it is to let him get setting people's necks on fire with tires, you know? And so, but I told them, I had a meeting. I said, I want you to go down there and tell the Haitians, every one of you, tell them the truth, tell them you disagree with me. And that will surprise them that I would send you. I said, tell them you disagree with me and then tell them what's gonna happen. 
And Colin Powell could have won an Academy Award because he got all the military people there and he said, I, he said, I think this is a mistake. I, I don't think we can fix you. He said, I don't approve of what General Satos is doing, but I think we shouldn't do this. But he said, I did work for President Clinton for 10 months. And I can tell you this, if he tells you he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. Here's what he's gonna do to you. <laughs> and it was stunning. So they caved, they said, okay, we'll go. And, uh, they, and, and none did the same thing with the parliamentary leaders and Carter worked the president of Haiti who was then largely ceremonial, but important because he was a distinguished man. What I want you to know is there's a lot of good people in Haiti. They want to do a lot of good things. There's an immense amount of talent there. There's an immense amount of creativity. They have been burdened by a horrible government and economic elites that control the country. They have been further weakened by after Martelli left office and the man who was murdered, Jonathan, he, he didn't know enough about politics to control things. And it happened just at the time when the drug gangs became resurgent all across the Americas. And they sought out weak states. That's why Guatemala and Honduras and Salvador have been so plagued by drug violence and why they sent so many immigrants to us. And Nicaragua, who's a country poorer than they are, but with a very effective military and police apparatus that's capable of controlling the drug gangs that has no immigrants because they can have order and safety and security. So that's what happened. And I, I think, so to ask what, to, I know what to be done. Then a third deal I did was, I was a UN special envoy, envoy to Haiti and I got Paul Farmer to be my deputy, the, distinguished public health doctor who just died. You may have seen in Haiti. He's, the, in my opinion, the most important public health doctor in the world and one of the greatest human beings I've ever known. And uh, anyway, we worked for three years. We had a great time. We did unbelievable things. I just, I'm just writing a book about my life out to the White House and I realized all the stuff he did is unbelievable. But it all went away because there was another election. And because they'll never, it'll never work unless we share more economic and political power. And unless the people who want to tear it down to keep 100% of a tiny pie, instead of take 10 or 20% of a great big one, are overcome. That's the basic issue. The Haitian diaspora, uh, when I started this, a friend of mine had a bad reaction to a surgery in New York. I'll never forget. And right before I went down to Haiti to run the, the AIDS program. And so I went by to check on my friend and the guy running the emergency room at this big New York hospital was a Haitian doctor. And I, so I started doing some research. At the time, Haitian Americans were less than 2% of the American black population, but 11% of the doctors. I mean, they're, you don't have to worry about them. There's nothing wrong with them. They are really smart and they work like hell and they've got great gifts. They've just been totally hosed by the economic and political organization of the country. And so if you want to do something about it, you, the, the deal I did, even when I did the AIDS program, I said, look, I'll come down here and do this, but don't anybody ask us for a bribe. If you do, we're out of here because I can't do that in one place without being hit up everywhere. So, and we never had a bits problem. A, so, so there are all kinds of things that happened. Paul Farmer was so respected. He, he built a hospital north of Haiti that was a teaching hospital and, and, uh, the drug gangs in this last violence down there closed off the port at Port-au-Prince. So nobody could get access to energy. And they never made the conversion I tried to get them to make. I, we solarize a lot of things, but they should, everything, the sun shines 300 days a year down there, the wind blows, they got lots of stuff, but 
anyway, they still need a lot of heavy fuel oil or diesel. And the gangs were keeping it all on the port and they were going to buy them. So <clears throat> one of my partners and close friends is a Dominican guy who's the largest provider of clean energy and uh, in the whole Central America. But he loves farmer too. And Paul called him and says, we can't keep this hospital open and we don't have any choice. And our solar panels are all broken and we can't get through anybody to prepare them. So he sent $50,000 worth of fuel a week to the border with the Dominican Republic and farmer got trucks to come up to the border, offload the fuel and take them back to the hospital. And they did that for four or five weeks before it finally calmed down. And I say that because there's always something you can do to make it better. And it's very easy to stand on the side and talk about what a miserable place it is. And even Hillary said she loved it. I mean, we had a fabulous trip there. We could, and I got her working and she, they funded the biggest new investment there. The State Department did. But she said, you know, you're going to get killed for doing this because, you know, they'll just, you can't fundamentally change the country and then they'll blame you and they'll say you failed. And I said, they can say whatever they want. I like it. I like them. Somebody needs to pay attention to them. And the way I keep score, I believe I'll be able to prove that they're better off than they would have been if we'd left them alone. And that's all I can do. So that's what my advice is. Haiti was the richest country in the Caribbean in 18.3, the richest island. Haiti was the largest pr producer of coffee in the world, more than Brazil and Colombia 200 years ago. And it's, it's sad, but it's reparable. And ironically, they're one of the countries that's most at risk from climate change and it could grow most and most fairly grow with the right sort of energy policy. Right now we are approaching finals. So I know that that's that end of the year, um, losing sight of the forest for the trees that are your capstones and your finals. But I think what this conversation has done is pull us back and let us look at what is important. It's that you are here because you're learning how to problem solve. That's what public service is about. You are learning how to have those difficult conversations. We put a lot of focus on our communications courses. We're starting a new communications and leadership track. And as we've heard from President Clinton, he had those tough conversations, the ones that he was trying to get through that everybody thought this can't be done. You can't talk to Northern Ireland and bring them to the table. Communication, problem solving, the metric of are the folks that you left better off than when you began, and also understanding the beauty that is public service, which is domestic and global, from helping some way in Conway, Arkansas, in terms of their reading program, to Haiti. And this is who you are. This is you. You are walking in the footsteps of the legacy that President Clinton has built. And I thank you all for joining us and those of you online and President Clinton, thank you. And we can't wait to have you back. Thanks, I, I would come every month if I could. I love, I love being here.